Thank you, God, that at the end of what we thought was the end, it was just the beginning. And how it wasn't done at the cross, it was done at that empty tomb. And Lord, I pray that you would be rolling stones today. Lord, as we have erected stones in our heart, in places of hardness that we have not yielded to you, Lord, roll those stones today, Lord. I pray that these dead bones, these dead portions of our lives, Lord, that you will breathe on them, Lord. Breathe on them. Just as you told the prophet Ezekiel, speak to the bones. Speak to the wind. Lord, you've spoken to us this morning and you bring life where there was death. Lord, you didn't just save us for heaven, you saved us for the here and now. And you're doing a mighty work, and I pray that you continue to do this work in our lives, and you promise that you will, so we can stand on it with boldness, that the work that you begin, you will bring to completion. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives individually, and what you're doing in this church, what you're doing in this community. Thank you that we are seeing a move of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. There are three things that we ask you to do at Sand Springs. We just that we keep it simple. I'm simple. So I have to keep things simple. And so we just keep it simple. Three words. We want you to know God. We want you to grow in God. And we want you to flow with God. Amen. That's pretty simple, right? There's, there's three ways in which we help you do that. Uh, the Sunday morning service, my goal is to help people know God. My goal is to help the lost get saved and to save know Him even more. That's my goal. And so I know my target when I'm coming on a Sunday morning. What, what's my goal? Help people know God. And then, we, uh, that's, that's, so we want you to come to worship service. That's what we want you to do. And then number two, we want you to grow in God. And we, we grow in God in our small groups. And we've got numerous small groups going on all the time. And, and uh, that is the best environment to grow in your faith. And, and it's because, and my whole sermon is pointed in this direction, but it is, it is when you put to use that thing which you already know. Happens in small group. Uh, um, every year, uh, somewhere along the, uh, October, November, I grow corn in the bed of my truck. <laughs> and it's because deer season, I'm always putting out corn, and it, it's going to spill in the bed of my truck, and there's always dirt in the bed of my truck. So you got rain, you got dirt, you got seeds, so we got the right elements. Uh, and so I grow corn in the bed of my truck, but I have never harvested corn in the bed of my truck. Why? Because I have the right elements, but I have wrong environment. All right? And so the environment for spiritual growth is in a small group. And so we would encourage you to get involved in a small group. We got them going on tonight. We got them going on tomorrow night. We got all week long, we got small groups going on. We would encourage you to do that, to grow in the Lord. So we want you to know God. We want you to grow in God. We want you to flow with God. And because we're sand springs, we have a water theme. And, and so we have what we call stream teams. And stream teams are, are those volunteer groups by which you're serving somewhere. And so here's what we want you to do. Serve somewhere. Serve somewhere. Find what your passion is and serve the Lord somewhere. You were not saved to sit. You were saved to serve. Amen? You were saved to serve. And so we want you to, you will be most fulfilled in your salvation when you are serving God. I promise you. If you have a Christian who's saying, there must be more to salvation than this, I'm going to say, yeah, are you serving? Are you giving? Are you serving? Those are the two things. If you're less than satisfied with your salvation, I want to know, are you giving? Are you serving? And so anyway, that, that was just kind of a short, not real short, but kind of a short rundown of no grow and flow. But here's the thing. I can teach and I can preach and you can know, but until your heart catches up with your head, you won't grow. So this morning, I'm not preaching to your head, I'm preaching to your heart. When God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, He immediately goes to work on their hearts. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. I'm going to look at the last verse of 14, but it's to prepare us for 15. 
Uh, the last verse of 14 says, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. Interestingly enough, he says 136 times, you will know that I am the Lord. God told the, the, the nation of Israel while they were in Egypt, He says, I'm going to do this, and you're going to know that I am the Lord. You're going to know. They're going to know. They're going to know. You hear me? No. You're going to know that I am the Lord. He says, the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord. And here's the nation of Israel. They begin to... they. They come to know that he is the Lord. Verse 31, thus Israel saw the great work, work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord. They knew. You with me? They believed the Lord and his servant Moses. However, and it's, I love chapter 15, they immediately go to praising God. There is power in praise. There is power in praise. If, if you do not get stirred up when we are worshiping, then there's a problem. With your spiritual walk. I'm not saying that you got to do anything. But there should be something stirring inside you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Because God gives us picture after picture after picture. The, the, the tabernacle is a picture of a human being. It's a picture of Jesus, but it's a picture of a human being. The outer courts is your body. The, 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 the holy place is your soul. Your mind is... Your emotions and your will. And the holy of holies is your spirit. The, the, the work of God started in the outer and it worked to the inner. But you don't go from outer court to holy of holies without going through the intellect and the emotions. Do you hear me? Does all this make sense? It, it should make sense that if we are worshiping God, there should be something stirring in your being. I, I listened to a lot of preaching growing up. Uh, and, and discounting emotions. Let me tell you, if your emotions aren't in it, there's another word for that. The emotions are called your heart. And Jesus was constantly referring to the heart, to the center place of your emotions, of, of your feelings. And so, anyway, I'm not sure why I got off on that for a little bit. But they immediately go to worshiping the Lord. They're praising God. There is an emotional stirring in chapter 15. And they, it, we call it the song of Moses and they begin singing songs about Moses and then pretty soon they go to complaining to Moses they go for three days without, without water look in verse 22 so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea then they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water by the way three days is the limit three days is it's the law of threes and survival three days without water three weeks without food three seconds without hope you're done so it's the law of three. And so three days is the limit. And, uh, and, and here we have uh, them to the, they're pushed to the limit. What's going on here? God immediately goes to work on their soul. They already have their, the knowledge of God can do anything. You hear me? Where did they just come from? The Red Sea. They, they just come from the Red Sea. It's amazing that God didn't just kind of, uh, as some... Goofballs have said, well, strong, it was shallow water and a strong wind. Uh, well, that's amazing because the water stood as a wall on either side. I ain't never seen a wind that strong. That's, I'm telling you, no, that's not a strong wind. That's a strong God. And not only that, but he drowned the whole uh, Egyptian army in that shallow water, which is pretty awesome. But no, it was, it was a, a wall of water on either side. There's nothing that God can't do. They now know that, and yet their heart hadn't caught up with their head. So he's now got to work on their heart. So he takes them to waters that match their soul. They're bitter. So here we are, chapter 15, verse 22. So Moses brought the Israel from the Red Sea, and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, where they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Verse 23. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. That's the name. That's the name. It's just bitter water. And the, so, so now they've gone for three days without water. And now the water that they get to is not drinkable. It's not drinkable. And so we've got this bitter water. And uh, verse 24, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord. Do you see where the people went to? They went to Moses complaining. You hear me? Here's what they should have done. They should have called upon the Lord. 
Because the water that God has now brought them through should have prepared them for the water that He has brought them to. Amen? Christian, if God saved you, is there anything He can't do in you? I mean to tell you, I, I, I know how rotten I am on the inside. I know how rotten I was. And I'm glad He has made some progress. You know what I mean? He has made some progress. But if he can take a dead spirit and breathe life into it, what we call being born again, if he can do anything, if he can do that, he can do anything in me. Amen? So if there's, if there's any question about what God wants to do in you, just remember your salvation. But the waters he brought them through should have prepared them for the waters that He brought them to, but they weren't prepared. They had junk in them. I'm going to ask you this question. What do you get when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. That's, what I, that's the response I expected. But what you get when you squeeze an orange is everything that's inside that orange. You get seeds, you get pulp. If there's bugs, you get bugs. If there's rot, you get rot. And guess what's inside of us? Sometimes there's bugs and rot. <laughs> and so you got to get squoze. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That is country, past tense for squeeze it. All right? <laughs> I'm not sure how you squeeze it. I don't know. The squoze. In country, we just shorten stuff. It's, it's not you all. It's y'all. All right? So we, they, got, they got squoze, and what came out was bitter. What came out was bitter. Let's, let's keep reading so they go without water for three days they they get to water that is not fit to drink and what do they immediately do their emotions come forth their emotions of bitterness come forth and so the people complain verse 24 uh, against Moses saying what shall we drink so he cried out to the Lord Moses and the Lord showed him a tree when he cast it into the waters the waters were made sweet there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. God is testing them. What is he doing? He's squeezing them. If you've ever had a flat tire on a bicycle, you'd have to, you know how to fix that thing. You pull that inner tube out, and then you've got to test it. You've got to air that thing up to it. almost looks like it's going to pop. And then if you still can't find the leak, you, you, you drown it. <laughs> You drown. You you put it under extreme pressure, and then you drown it. And then I said, "Oh, there's my spot. There's my weakness. There's my problem." As I was messing with those old horses, as I was training horses, I was what we would call it sacking them out. You'd take a, a saddle blanket and you just you just moving it around them, and you you first work in the air around them, and then you work on the horse, and you begin just touching them all over. And if I touch them somewhere, and all of a sudden they jump, oh, there's my spot. There's my spot. I need to work on this spot. If they're afraid here, I need to work here. If they're, if they're touchy here, I need to work here. God has to apply pressure in your life. And I'm telling you, I know what pressure is all about. And you know what pressure is all about. If one more person tells me to put on my mask. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I know this ain't right. But I, I was walking in Walmart the other day. And the guy says, I just want to remind you to put on your mask. I said, thank you. That's all I said. <laughs> I didn't put it on. Anyway, God bless you. Pressure reveals content. Pressure reveals content. And so as the, he is testing them, he didn't, he didn't test them for him to know what was. Nah, this is good. I didn't preach this in the early service. It just reminded me. He didn't test them for him to know what was in them. He tested them for them to know what was in them. So sometimes, sometimes we are under pressure and, and maybe, and never, never blame uh, God for hurt. Never blame, when someone does something against you, don't blame God. God has given that person free will. Why, why is it? Mm, I was wondering if I was, if, if I was actually going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Y'all know if it comes to my mind, I'm going to say it. Why? Boy, this is off. This is on live stream too. 
Why is it that I don't worry about a virus, but I carry a pistol on my hip? I'm sorry. If that bothers you, I'm sorry. But here's, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Because man has free will. And I will not, by will, <laughs> allow someone to victimize my family or the people I love. But a virus don't. It must yield to God. That's my theology. Man is the one thing in all creation that has free will and can refuse a good God. Everything else has to answer to God. We will answer to God, but he allows us a time of leniency and then we will stand before our God and answer for what we did with our free will. Do you hear me? That's my theology. That's why, that's why I don't worry. I don't worry about stuff. I don't worry... But I'm prepared for people. I don't know how else to tell you that. And that, that, I'll probably get mail. I'll probably, I'll probably get calls. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. So, verse 25, he tested them. And he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. It got hot in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Man, I don't know. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I talked about that. But anyway. Uh, so, interestingly enough, how do I know that this passage of Scripture is talking about them and not the water? Now, he's going to fix the water. But it is only an illustration of how he needed to fix them. Here's how I know. Verse 26. I, I did not read this last portion of verse 26 because I want to highlight it. He says, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who does what? Heals you. He needed to heal them. And sometimes God has to squeeze us and, because he has to reveal it before he can heal it. So it's, if you don't know what's there, if you don't know what's there, he has to reveal it. And you say, how would I not know it's there? I can promise you. There are things in your soul, in your, in your being, that are below the surface, and they're below the surface because you buried it. And when it tries to come up, you push it back down and you cover it over. And yet God has to bring it up. He has to reveal it so he'll heal it. But he, he, because of your free will, He won't heal what you won't give. Isn't that something? We have to come to God and say, he, He's showing them. He's showing them with an illustration. He immediately takes them from the Red Sea to Mara. He says, I got, a, I got an illustration for you what's on the inside of you. It's called bitterness. So this is August. September is Christy and I, our anniversary. And... Um, this September will be the one year anniversary, is how I remember it, of my all time spiritual low point. Our last anniversary, I uh, had it all planned in that we were going to go to Caddo Lake. We rented out a cabin on Caddo Lake, and, and I take the boat there, and we're going to have a good time. Just, it's just going to be sweet. It's just going to be relaxing and calm, and just she and I are going to do some, some boat tours around Caddo Lake. Well, I had it all planned until I get there and the boat won't crank. And I worked on that stupid boat and I worked on that stupid boat and, and then I, man, I went and bought batteries and I went and did everything in the world. I'd take it home to the cabin and then back to the lake. And let me tell you, it pushed me to the point of breaking. It pushed me to the point where I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to give up on ministry and be real honest with you, I was ready to give up on God. Preacher, can you really reveal all this? Well, that's kind of what my wife said. Because when I went to on my rant and stuff began flowing out of my mouth, it revealed what was in my heart. And she's like, you can't say that. She was afraid God was going to strike me dead. And I haven't told anybody else, but here I am blabbing in my mouth today. Telling people like, uh, Whatever. But here's what I said. I said, I don't believe God is good. I don't believe God is good. 
And here's what I said. I have served him. I have given my whole life to him. And I have done this, that, and I was ranting. I was having a fit. That's what I was doing. I was having a hissy fit. And I said to God, I guess I'll just be your good little boy and get the hand-me-downs like I've always gotten. And then it dawned on me. So that's how I feel. I didn't know I felt like that. I didn't know I felt like, I f- man, it's like, oh, I didn't know that was in there until I got squoze. I didn't know that was in there. I, I, I didn't know I felt like that about God. And, and all of a sudden, it just come running out of my mouth. I was like, oh. It took me a little while to get to the, oh, because I was still mad. And then God, in his great patience and kindness, didn't say a thing. He's like, now we know what's in there. Now we know what's in there. And those low lows, guess what? Help you to grow, grow. But you got to know before you grow. Amen. So as I'm just spilling my guts to you and everybody on live stream, sometimes... God has to show you what's on the inside. He's got to reveal it so He can heal it. And that comes in some very unpleasant ways sometimes. But God never wastes a hurt. He don't cause the hurt. He allow this corrupt world to cause it. But He won't waste it. And He'll take everything bad and turn it into something good. Because He's good. So here's what had to happen with the nation of Israel. They, they knew that he was God, but they did not know that he was good. And, and sometimes, I'm going to tell you, sometimes we're the exact same way. We know he's God. He can do anything. We're not so sure he's good. Why? Why do we question his goodness? Well, because he's not there when I need him. He doesn't hear when I call him. And he doesn't act when I need him the most. At least that's what we think. And so we begin to question the goodness of God. But what I know now is that he is hearing me when I call him. It's exactly what he told the nation of Israel three times. I have heard your cries. I see your tears. I care for you and I'm coming to rescue you. That's what he told them. But they didn't feel that he cared for them. And so instead of bringing their concerns to the God who heals, they brought their complaints to the man who represented him. Man, how many times have I had, I have had people that I've sat and counseled with and they would, just, they would bring a list of issues that they had and I would point them to Jesus with every one of those issues and they just kept coming up with new issues and new issues and new issues and after this council service has gone on for so long I have recognized the problem unbelief it's the absolute essence of every issue every problem in the Christian life it's unbelief they come to this point in their life in which they should have been trusting God but they did not believe God Oh, that he knew that he could, but they did not believe he would. So God says, we're going to have to work on that. And now, it's so cool. It's so strange. And it's so cool. Verse 25, so he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. I want to know what kind of tree this is. I'm, you know, thinking retirement, you know. Just kidding. In the ministry, you never retire. But I am thinking of, I get a new boat. Anyway. <laughs> so, what kind of tree is this? I don't know what kind of tree this is. It don't matter what kind of tree it is. It wasn't the tree, it was the God who pointed it out. We will call friends. We will look on Facebook. We will Google. We will try and find every explanation for what we're going through. And God says, come to me with your burdens. With your cares, Jesus says, cast all your cares upon me for I care for you. And, and, and yet, when Moses, the one who was seeking God, asked God, God says, throw that tree in the water. Throw, throw the tree in the water. 
<laughs> Never thought of that. And they throw the tree. The key is in the tree. Say that with me. The key is in the tree. One more again. The key is in the tree. If you wonder if God cares for you, the key is in the tree. If you wonder if God loves you, the key is the tree. The key is the tree. If you want, the Bible says that cursed is every man who hangs upon a tree. Cursed is every man. The key is the tree. That because I am in Christ Jesus, the curse has moved off of me onto Him, and He resolved it at the cross. The cross cured the curse. Amen? That's good news for me. There's sweetness in everything bitter when I go to the cross. Why is it that oftentimes I will come and even if you're not here and if the lights aren't on, I will come and bow at the cross. There's nothing special about it. Oh, it's a pretty special cross. But, but it, it's not that piece of wood. It's just a symbol of the tree that Jesus Christ died on. He... he he absorbed all of my curse, all of my fault, all of my shame, all of my guilt. He took it upon Him. It is a symbol of the love of God. And so sometimes I just come in in the dark and just sit down there at the foot of the cross. Oftentimes in the invitation, I just come at the foot of the cross. Because the key is the tree. And when there's bitterness, I need to come to the tree. And so, when the question comes, does God even care about me? The key is the tree. Jesus says, the scripture says in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8, For God has demonstrated his love for us. Now, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The key is the tree. For God so loved the world, John three sixteen. If you ever question his love, the key is the tree. Amen? If you ever question your worth, the key is the tree. How do I know what something is valuable? What would you give for it? What would you give for it? What did God give for you? His only begotten son. Is there anything, was, was there anything more valuable to God the Father than his only begotten son? Well, obviously you. You are so valuable that he gave his only begotten son. If you ever question your value, the key is the tree. If you ever, ever, ever question your worth, the key is the tree. If you ever question his love. And that old bitterness, see that's the thing, is they knew with their head the truth that he is God, but they did not believe in their heart that he was good. And, he, and the scriptures give us this weird little thing about throwing the tree in bitter water. Why? It's for us. I'm sure they didn't get it. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, and he tells us in Hebrews, it's for our lesson, our example, for our understanding that Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place. And those little pictures, those little hints, those little mysteries are, are concealed in his scriptures so that it would be revealed to us. Amen? All right, I got to keep going. <sighs> well, as we continue looking, what happens now is they move on from Mara. Well, I'm glad they moved on from Mara. We got some sweet water. And uh, now we move on to some other water. And now we're out of food. Guess what? Well, we're out of food. Now we got water. We ain't got no food. Now we ain't got food or water. <laughs> if you keep reading chapter 16, that'll be next week, by the way. We're going to skip over it. We're going to talk about the bread from heaven next week. But I want you to turn now to chapter 17. Guess what comes up again? Bitterness, it always does. How many of you have ever done much gardening? Anybody done much gardening? How many of you have a lawn? <laughs> you got stuff growing up in your lawn, and you go and it's like, ooh, that's a dandelion. I don't know. Is a dandelion the thing? Go, you blow? All right. That's not supposed to be in my lawn. You go and you top it off. I want that in there. Top it off. Guess what it's going to do? Of course it's going to come back. Why? Because it's got a root in there that's got to be dealt with. And so bitterness always comes back up. And this is why the Bible calls it a root of bitterness. And so here it comes back up. Chapter 17, verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. They failed the first test. They get to take it again. Yay! How many of us love testing? 
Young people are going back to school. Ah, oh, just ready for a good test. Amen. No, we don't like the test. But when you fail it, you get to take it again. And so here we get to take it again. Uh, verse 2. What were they supposed to learn the first time, by the way? What were they supposed to learn? Turn to the Lord. Call on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. This is what they should have learned. Because the water he brought them through should have prepared them for the water he brought them to or the lack thereof. And they have no water. Verse 2. Therefore the people get what they did. The same thing they did the first time. The people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Who do they go to? Moses. Who do you go to? Facebook. Dr. Phil. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we, we need to go to the Lord. And they go to Moses and they're ready to kill him. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you, not, why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They, they are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And take in your hand your rod which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Man, I want that stick. <laughs> I want that staff. You know what I'm he, he, he holds that staff over the Red Sea, the Red Sea opens up. He holds the, Man, I want that staff. It ain't the staff, y'all know that, right? It's God. And, and here God says, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, when you come to God, He will give you an answer. And then when they weren't coming to God, they weren't getting an answer. Why did it take day three before we call out to God? Why is it that we, we're pushed to the brink, to the edge, before we finally call out to God? I believe He would have revealed it on day one. If they'd have trusted Him. If they'd have trusted Him. That was the whole point of the test. Trust, trust God. And so, now that they're thirsty, and now they're complaining, uh, uh, they complain to Moses. Moses asked God, and God says, I want to tell you what to do. I want you to get your staff, and I want you to strike that rock. When you strike that rock, water comes forward. Well, guess what? We have a clue as to what that rock is. What this rock means. What this lesson is for us. In the Scriptures, there are so many types and shadows and symbols. And man, the Word of God began, began to just explode in my understanding as I began to see types and shadows and symbols. And one of the, the, the types in the Scriptures is stone. Stone represents, guess what? Law. It represents the law. So, so what does this mean? He, he smacks the law and water comes forth? No. So, so if you remember when God gives the Ten Commandments, coming up in chapter 20, it was etched on what? Stone, and the Ten Commandments were the law of God, and so it's etched on stone. And all through the Scriptures, you'll see this picture of stone come up over and over again. It represents the law. And when Jesus was pictured in Daniel's vision, I love the book of Daniel. You take an atheist or agnostic who don't believe the Word of God, and, and you show them the book of Daniel, they'll have to try and, and, and explain away Daniel before they can explain away the Word. Because Daniel prophesied about all the nations, all the, 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 the governments of the world that would come and rule the world. And then he prophesied about, it was a, it was a, there was this vision of this statue. And on that statue we had all the different uh, types of metal. Gold, silver, bronze, stone, uh, iron, and stone. And, and, and they represented uh, uh, um, Babylon, Medes and Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. And then in this vision comes a, guess what, a stone. A stone. And that stone comes and hits that statue, and that statue comes down, and now we know what that stone is. That stone is Jesus. And when the Romans, which were the feet, when the Romans uh, were a part of the crucifixion of Christ, it ushered in the kingdom of God. I'm a part of the kingdom of God. I don't know if it's, you, I get excited over this stuff. I get excited over the kingdom of God because I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. None of the other world governments could stand up to the stone of Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'm a part of Old Rocky. 
And so we have a picture of why is he pictured as a stone? When, when he was asking his disciples, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, come from the dead, yada, yada, yada. Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, well said, Peter. Man did not, you didn't come to know that by man, but by God. Therefore, I call you Little Rock. <laughs> little Rocky. I call you Petros. I call you Peter. Petros means little rock. And then upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. What an awesome truth. Jesus is now saying that he's the rock. The scripture calls him the corner stone. Why is law and Jesus, how in the world does that, if Jesus is the stone and the law is the stone, how do we make that work? Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. You do not have to fear the law of God if you are in Christ Jesus. Do you hear me? God is God and he is so good that all of the law was fulfilled on the cross of Calvary. Amen? You don't have to fear it. God is good. He loves you so much that all of his wrath was consumed upon Jesus so that you wouldn't have to experience it. He's the fulfillment of the law. And when he said it's finished on the cross, remember that? It wasn't exactly finished until what happened? The stone was rolled away. Woo! Are y'all seeing this? Are y'all seeing this? The st- this is no accident. It's not coinky dink. <laughs> This is the word of God. It, it, it told us the stone was rolled away. Hallelujah. Guess what? He's still rolling stones. And if you still feel condemned and ashamed and guilty, if you are not in Christ Jesus, you are guilty. But if you are in Christ Jesus, you're not. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's still rolling stones. He has rolled away the stone. And so we have this picture now of, of a stone being smacked. That's so weird. God is so weird. No, he's not weird. He is so cool that he is showing us pictures. He is showing us, he is revealing to us truths in which when Jesus was struck and killed, the law was fulfilled. You hear me? Did it, you ought to say amen if you do. When Jesus was struck and killed, the law was fulfilled. Amen. Now you're getting it. All right. So when the law was fulfilled, something else happened. Water come flowing out. I don't know if you're catching it, but here it comes. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets with a woman at a well. And he says, if you're thirsty, come to me, and in you will flow springs of water. Springs of water, saying Springs. (laughs) <laughs> and then in John chapter 7, he says, if you're thirsty, he's shouting to everybody. He, sh- he messes up their whole party and messes it up. and says, If anyone's thirsty, come to me, and out of you will do what? Flow. No, grow, and do what? Flow. Out of you will flow, not trickles, rivers of living water. He said thus, speaking of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, here we have a picture in the wilderness. They're thirsty. Are you thirsty, Christian? Are you thirsty? Are you not satisfied in your salvation? How do I become satisfied in my salvation? Let the Holy Spirit flow through you. Let Him flow through you. He must be flowing through you. You need to be serving. You need to allow Him to flow through you. By serving, you are fulfilled. By watering, you are watered. This is a great past scripture that God showed me in a deer stand. When you are watering, you are yourself watered. There's those who hold back what is right and remain thirsty. And then there's those who give and are themselves watered. That's scripture. And so here's a picture. When Jesus was struck, the law was fulfilled. And for me as a Christian, Jesus is the source of living water. I'm going to say this. It messes people up when I say it. Jesus is not the living water. He never claimed to be. Jesus is not the living water. I know we sing 
Maybe sometimes about Jesus being the living water. Mm -mm, he's not the living water. I can go to that water fountain out there, and that water fountain is not water. It's a water fountain. It's the source of water. There's a fountain, and there's water. They're different. They're different. Jesus is the source of the water. He is the fountain. He, and he did claim this, I am the fountain of living water. You go to Jesus. You must go to Christ Jesus by the way of the cross before the Holy Spirit begins flowing through your life. That's it. That's the key. The tree is the key. Amen? The tree is the key. It's always the key. It's always the key. So now he has taught them a lesson. The tree is the key. And now he takes them to the rock that flows water. What a weird thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 talks about with, they all drank, the nation of Israel, they all drank from the same rock. And he's, that's weird. That's weird. And, and then he's saying, we drank from that same spiritual rock. So what's this? What is this talking about? It is talking about how we come to Jesus Christ, the source, and not only is He the, the means by which we work, but by, by which we are also fulfilled. It's that spiritual rock. So we're going to rank, try and close this thing before you can truly grow in the Lord. It has to move from the knowledge from your head to your heart. Not just that He is God, but that He is good. He is good. And if there's bitterness that's in there, it's going to keep coming up. It's going to keep coming up. And bitterness will block your blessings. Bitterness will hinder your growth. You, you, he, he, he starts with it. He starts with, they have been in captivity for 400 years, the nation of Israel. He knows they're hurting on the inside. He knows that they need to be delivered from those old hurts. And we need to be delivered from those old hurts, those old habits, those old hang-ups. We've got to be delivered. But he's got to reveal it before he can heal it. But he's got to heal it. Because you've got to get repaired to be prepared for the promises. Amen? I tell you what, some of us need some... Repairing. Let me, let me correct that. Uh, that's, that's not exactly right. Every one of us needs some repairing. There's not a person in here without some sort of a hurt. We live in a bad neighborhood. I ain't meaning Athens. <laughs> Berkison. Ooh, yeah, that Berkson, that's a rough neighborhood. You know, they got... Whatever. We're not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this corrupt world. And you can't go through this corrupt world without getting hurt. And oftentimes we will translate that hurt to God. Well, he could have stopped it. He could have kept that from happening. He could have kept me from being molested. He could have kept me from, from being victimized. He could have kept whatever you're hurt. He could have kept them from dying. He could have kept what, whatever you're hurt. Sometimes we'll, we will translate that to God and, 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 and we don't even know it's there until He reveals it. He's got to reveal it to heal it. And He wants to heal you. I'm going to read that verse 1 last time. Oh, I had so much more I wanted to preach on today. but He says, I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. Uh, James uh, 3, 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. It talks about how stuff comes out of our mouth. Here's where it says it. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Well... Maybe, I don't know. Humans do. And he says, we got to clean up those bitters. we got to clean up that bitterness. Get that out of there. 
He says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevines bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you, let him out show by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have what? Bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Don't talk about such... That how you're such a super saint when there's still old bitterness in there. How do you know it's in there? It will come out. <laughs> and how does it come out? Out of my mouth. It will come out. God may put you in a relationship with a sandpaper saint. <laughs> with one of those that just irritate the snot out of you. Why? So that when it comes out of your mouth, he's like, whoop, that, see it? What is that in there? Let me heal that. He doesn't do it to judge you. He doesn't do it to shame you. He doesn't do it to accuse you. He does it to heal you. I am the God who heals you. He is God. And he is good. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to... Quit buying the lie. Sometimes it comes from bad, bad preaching. Sometimes it comes from bad teaching. But there is a lie that our soul just swallows up. And that is, God's angry with you. God is hard. God is harsh. God is judgmental. And yet you say, God is love. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. Lord, I pray that we would come to you for a good healing this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have an invitation. Let's stand together. Y'all know I've been gone for almost three weeks. That's why it's 12.07 and I'm still preaching. I couldn't quit. But if lunch is about to burn, let it burn and get freed up. Amen. Because if there's some old hurt there, old bitterness there, guess what it's going to do? Come up again. Come up again. It'll haunt you your entire life until you dig it up. Let him heal it. And this would be a great time to have, have him do it supernatural work of God this is a supernatural work of God the healing of the soul is a supernatural work of God I am the God who does what heals you we can have physical healings and we do we do we've seen just this week we got some good uh, heart tests back <laughs> a God who heals we've had God heal people of cancer just, we've had God heal people we believe it and we've seen it. But there are some healings that aren't visible. Except for the person who's hurt. He wants to heal that even more than a broken bone. And a hurting heart. It, it, it's not, it's not the, the blood pumping organ that's so essential to life as that seat of emotions. God wants to heal that too. He would come to him for the supernatural healing. Even now. Shame is a prison, as cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Well, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power who my freedom song is found. Now there ain't no
when I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of that ground, yeah, cause there ain't no grave, ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Smooth and velvet tongue And fear is a tyrant Oh, it tells me to run Well, love is resurrection And love is a trumpet sound And love is my weapon I'm gonna take my giant down There ain't no has no grip on you any longer. We're not just talking about when I am resurrected from the ground. I'm talking about resurrection now. Amen? And there's a faith action that reminds me that the curse was reversed on the cross. We're going to have communion. Find a communion cup. The, cur the curse was reversed on the cross. This is a faith action. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, no matter where you're from, we invite you to join with us. Scriptures tell us that by His stripes we are healed. And that His body was given for our bodies. We might be well. He is the God who heals you. Amen. So we take this bread. Lord Jesus, You are the bread from heaven. You gave Your body that ours might be healed. You gave your body to be broken that ours might be whole. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you. Yes, Lord. We trust in you for protection. We trust in you for provision. We trust in you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we receive this bread. Amen. His body was given for our bodies. Blood was given for our soul. Amen? Amen. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the different ways that people take communion. There's all sorts of ways people take communion. Sometimes they'll combine the two. Jesus didn't combine the two. There are two distinct acts involved in communion. The bread is the body. 
His body was given for your body. The blood, he says, there is no, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If you come to Christ, it was on account of the blood. That sacrifice there in that nation of Egypt that saved them. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God. We are saved by His blood. Lord God, we thank You that You bled on our behalf. Your body, we, are, we continue to say it. We trust You, God. Lord Jesus, Your body was given for our bodies. Your blood was given for our soul. And that our spirits would be saved, born again. Thank you, Lord. Forgiveness is through you. We receive your forgiveness by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ain't God good? We say that. We, we'll do that, man. We've been doing that in churches for a long time. We say, God is good. We do that. We've been doing that for years. And we can say it. You know it, but I'm gonna ask you this. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Because he really is good. Even when I questioned it and accused him otherwise, all he did was show me his goodness. He had every right to smush me like a roche. <laughs> a little cockroach. He had every right. To smush me. But he didn't smush me like a cockroach. He just loved me. He said we had to get that out so we can go on. Whatever comes your way, God's good. And let me tell you this. He gives you the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Lord covered that. He also gave you the grace of the church body. I love y'all so much. And we, we, we enjoyed a little break. But it wasn't a break for me, I promise. Because uh, we just, we were just so ready to get back home to you. And we just love y'all so much. So, anyway, thank you for being so good, so loving, so kind. We love you. Those of you who are on Facebook or can't see you, we love you as well. You're just as much a part of us if you're live on live stream as if you are here in body. We love you as well. Well, if I hadn't got to meet you yet, come to Welcome Room. I'll be right over here. We got, got lots of cupcakes and things, so come see me. Because if you don't eat them, I will. <laughs> anyway, God bless you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your goodness. You are the God who heals. And we trust you with that. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us at Sand Springs. We hope you felt God's presence and His power in our worship today. If you'd like to speak to a pastor, text Jesus Saves at 31996. You can also stay connected with us on social media at sandspringsbc.com. Also, you can join us live every Wednesday at 6 p.m. for Couch Talk Bible Study. Thank you again for joining us at Sand Springs. We pray you have a blessed week.